Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We will start with a recitation from the Quran, Brother Muhammad Khan. I seek the refuge with God from Satan the accursed in the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Had we sent down this Quran on a mountain, thou would have certainly seen the mountain humbled itself and rent asunder for the fear of God. And we set forth these similitudes unto mankind that they may reflect. He is the God, there is no God save He, the knower of the unseen and the seen. He is the beneficent, the most merciful. He is God, there is no God except Allah, the King, the Holy, the, the bestower of peace, of conviction, 
the guardian, the ever prevalent, the supreme, the great absolute. God is free from everything they are so ascribed to him. He is Allah, the creator, the maker, the fashioner. His are all the excellent names. Whatever is in the heavens and the earth praises him, and he is the ever prevalent, the all wise. This is the truth from the greatest, the most high. Thank you. Uh, our topic tonight is American problems, Islamic solutions. We will try to address how Islam can present solutions to the problem this society faces. How can we make these solutions acceptable and effective? My name is Bassam Osman and I will be your moderator tonight. Our first speaker is Brother Hamza Yusuf. Uh, he accepted Islam seven years, ten years ago, and he studied Arabic and fiqh in the Muslim world. Uh, he is now Imam, Khatib, and Arabic teacher in Santa Clara. He studied nursing and herbal medicine, and he practices some herbal medicine as well. Uh, I am told also he is working on translating some Islamic books and also extensively in Dawa, You have met him and heard him before. Uh, we are late. Without further delay, I have the honor to introduce Brother Hamza Yusuf. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أحمده وأشكره وأعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وصرواته والسلام على رسول الله وبعد I want to first إن شاء الله recite a short piece of Quran شيطان رجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وضرب الله مذاع الرجلين أحدهما أبكم لا يقدر على شيء وهو كل على مولاه أينما يوجه لا يأتي بخير هل يستوي هو ومن يأمر بالعدل وهو على صراط مستقيم آمنت بالله صدق الله مولانا العظيم ان شاء الله i'm going to get to this ayah do you have some water <laughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم the first thing i want to say is that uh, i didn't choose the topic and without any offense to most likely the engineer that did because it's engineering vocabulary I want just to say that, and with real respect, I'm not being facetious, I want to say that um, the problems and solutions are not uh, Quranic vocabulary. And I think it's essential that we constantly look to the Quranic vocabulary and the vocabulary of the Prophet ﷺ in order to clarify our thoughts. I think the reason that uh, problems and solutions are uh, a tricky way of looking at, at the situation that we're in is that they're, they're structural by nature and they're mechanistic and they're, uh, they're also uh, quantitative as opposed to qualitative uh, ways of looking at things. If you look at the Qur'an, the basic 
way that the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses human beings is uh, that kufr is a disease and Islam is a shifa and it's I think this is an extremely important point because it's a biological perspective is dealing with life it's not dealing with inanimate things problems are inanimate things solutions are inanimate things whereas disease and health are those aspects of biological creatures of creatures that have life and so the Quran talks about uh, those who have a disease in their hearts the Quran talks about the shifa uh, that the Quran is a shifa is a healing for what's in the sudur and so if you look at our situation in that perspective there's a few things that you will arrive at particularly if you've had any experience in medicine and one of them is that diseases are not things that suddenly happen in the same way that kufr isn't something that suddenly happens diseases are things that actually take place over a very long period of time you have in acute diseases the prodromal period which is that period where the disease is taking hold in the body and then the acute stage and then the uh, recuperation in chronic illness you have a very long process and what we're dealing here in this society and really in the whole world we can extend the metaphor uh, far beyond America because America is only uh, although we can say it's it is in a sense one of the most virulent kufars to use the biological metaphor, it's one of the most virulent kufars that has ever uh, attacked the social body, you see. And unfortunately, the defense system, the Muslims that are really, to extend this, are really the immune system of humanity. You see, we are the, the white cells, we are the, the, the leukocytes that, that come together to stop the destruction of the, of the social body. If the immune system breaks down, for instance, like in AIDS, uh, then there's no defense system, you see. So we have now in the Muslim world really an acquired immune uh, disease. This is what's happened. And uh, alhamdulillah, we didn't get it the same way that uh, the people that have AIDS got it. But there is a historical pattern and process there that you can see. What we're dealing with in the United States and really in the entire world, if we want to sum it up in one uh, word, I think the best term for it is nihilism and nihilism is is an affliction of the society and it has two aspects the first aspect is the is the, the the nihilism of the self whereby the human being sees himself as something groundless without meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negates this aspect in the Quran the Quran tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't create this universe batil, batila. He didn't make it uh, out of uh, vanity or as a vain thing or as a uh, false thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran um, that the, the human being uh, is not suda. He's not something that uh, has no meaningful end. You see, there's a purpose to our existence. What nihilism is, is a crisis in the human uh, self whereby no purpose is actually seen now as a social phenomenon nihilism manifests itself as a breakdown of the social structure whereby the value system that was preserving the social order suddenly begins to uh, self-destruct and there are reasons for that I don't, I don't really want to go into that but there are reasons for that we can look at the the, uh, the Renaissance the Enlightenment period the move from a uh, Christian worldview to a rationalist worldview and then into the industrial revolution to a mechanical worldview and then the technical worldview uh, you can look and see the stages whereby we have arrived to this point in time so this is a very serious disease I don't think it's something uh, that we can uh, right off as a problem I wish it was because if it was a problem we could solve it it's not a problem it is a disease and it needs to be treated but we need a few things when we talk about treating we need doctors to diagnose we need nurses to uh, to nurse and we need hospitals whereby people are 
uh, brought back to health. Islam, and again, I don't, I don't see Islam as some disembodied uh, abstract. Islam, my understanding of Islam, is that Islam is action itself. That Islam is action. What uh, one of the uh, North African fuqaha, Ahmed Zarruq, he's a commenter of the Risad of Ibn Abi Zayn al-Qairawani, he said, man, man adraka maqam al-Islam, ma fatara an al-amal. The one that realizes the station of Islam, he'll never be exhausted of action, of work. So that Islam is, is it is a a noun that is indicating a name thing and that thing is a Muslim we cannot see Islam as something that is in the books that uh, is a theoretical school of thought or something Islam is the Muslim community who are practicing the teaching of Islam that's what Islam is kufr is the kuffar who are practicing the milla of kufr the Qur'an tells us that Islam is based on Tawheed, on a correct perspective of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this, if we want to look at the, the, the dilemma that we can say that is embodied in the Christian culture or the Judeo-Christian culture, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, to say to the people of the book, Ta'alu. Come to a word, and I want to get back to that about the word. Come to a word that is shared among us, is common among us. That we worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we do not commit shirk with other than Allah. We do not associate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nor do we take one and the other as lords beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this is a deep message to humanity. Because what it's saying is that there is a relationship between the human being and his lord that takes him outside of a sick relationship. And the sick relationship is the subjugation of one people with the oppression from another people. These are the two camps in kufr that people exist in. Those who are lords and those who are, being, who are taking those lords as lords other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what the Quran says. To leave this to come to a word that is we share amongst us that we only worship Allah and we don't associate with him and we don't take one another as lords beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this culture there is a relationship between the masters and the servants in the entire world now we can see this relationship between masters and servants those who are dictating you see, whether it's through the media, whether it's through the dominant uh, laws, whether it's through the people that legislate those laws, whether it's through the banking empire that subjugates people to interest debt, whereby they become indentured servitudes for their entire lives. However you want to look at that, this sick relationship exists on the earth. It exists in every single human society on the earth today. Islam came to abolish that. Islam came to abolish that. It came to take people out of the misperception, of the misconception of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To make the human being realize that in fact he is nothing and she is nothing other than the Khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this elevates in that case it elevates the human being to a position of slavehood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and complete and absolute freedom to everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what this society does is it makes people slaves to their lowest aspect it makes people slaves and according to the Mufassirin, there are two types of diseases in the heart. Sh shahawat and shubuhat. Now shahawat are easy to deal with. 
Shahwat are not difficult. The difficult thing is the shubuhat. The shahwat are those aspects of the lower self, of sex, of food, of those primal uh, energies. The shubuhat are in the itiqad, in the way the human being perceives reality. And this is what the book transformed. This is what the Quran changes. In the verse that I read here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Darab Allahu mathalan rajulain. Allah has given us a similitude, a metaphor, an analogy of two men. Ahaduhuma abkam. One is unable to speak. Now this is a deep statement here that Allah has chosen to say that he was unable to speak. Allah tells us that the kufar are summun bukmun umyun, that they are blind, deaf, and dumb. Because they can't see reality, they don't hear reality, and they're unable to articulate reality. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us here that this man, Allah is striking a similitude of a human being that is unable to articulate. In other words, the word, the kalima, is not in his possession. Because of that, that person, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, لا يقدر على شيء He's unable to do anything. He is unable to do anything. He is incapacitated. He is ajiz. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَهُوَ كَلٌ عَلَى مَوْلَاهُ He is a burden for his master. He is a burden for his master. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَيْنَ مَا يُوَدِّهُ لَا يَأْتِي بِخَيْرٍ Anywhere that his master directs him, he brings no good. He brings no good. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, هَلْ يَسْتَوِي هُوَ Are they the same? This man and the man who, وَمَنْ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْرِ وَهُوَ عَلَى سِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ The one who enjoins justice and he is on a straight path. This is the Muslim, the one who enjoins justice. But he enjoins it through articulation. Therefore, he has a world view. He has a Quranic picture. If you look at the pre-Islamic Arabs, their troubles were not all that dissimilar to what we see in this society, except this, is, this society has been able to take it to an extreme that in many ways is beyond belief. But we see some very interesting similarities. And the Quran talks about the jahiliyyat al-ula, the first jahiliyyah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the women not to go out and show their ornaments like that first jahiliyyah. And when Omar heard that ayah, he asked Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, what do you say about jahiliyyat al-ula? And Ibn Abbas said, وَهَلْ هُنَكَ أُولَى إِلَّا وَهُنَكَ أَخِرَى Is there any first thing except that you have a last thing? In other words, there would be a second jahiliyyah. Now, if you look at that period, the Arabs had a distinguishing characteristic. They were able to articulate. This is the power that the Arabs were given. Language is that thing that empowers the human being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ar-Rahman. عَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنِ خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانِ عَلَّمُهُ الْبَيَانِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the Qur'an and created man and taught him utterance. He taught him how to articulate. He taught him how to perceive through language, through the power of language. The first revelation is iqra, recite, say, recite. The Prophet said, Ma'ana biqari, your misunderstanding, iqra, ma'ana biqari, iqra, bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, in the name of your Lord who created. He was empowered by the word. He was empowered by the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Arabs were describing the desert. They were describing women. They were describing wine. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them a description of reality. And with that description of reality, they embodied it. It entered in on a cellular level until Aisha radiallahu anha describes the Prophet, his nature, kana khuluquhu al-Qur'an. His nature, his character was the Qur'an. Wa innaka la'ala khuluqin azim. And you are on a vast character. What is Qur'an? Qur'an is al-Qur'an al-Azim, the vast Qur'an. So anyone following this Qur'an, this word, is on a vast character. 
And wherever he goes, he ya'muru bil adri. He is enjoining justice because it's transforming him. And this is the power of Islam. The power of Islam is to transform human beings, to change societies, to alter the way we perceive reality, and to take that perception out to those who are still enchained in the delusions of this world. This is Islam. Look at the Sahaba. Look at Mus'ab ibn Umar, a man that was obsessed with his self. A man that had a new robe for every day. And Islam transformed him. It took lead and alchemically changed it into gold. His soul became gold. It became dhahabi. And wherever he went, he transformed people because he became a vehicle of transformation. Look at Bilal al-Habashi, radiallahu anhu, an Abyssinian slave, an Abyssinian slave, abkam, unable to speak. They say Mamluk bila hunuk, the Arabs, a slave without a jaw, because slaves don't speak. And Bilal al-Habashi becomes a teacher of men. He transforms those around him. He becomes a caller to the prayer. He's elevated. It takes the, the low and elevates them and makes them great. Look at Umar ibn al-Khattab, a man who Rashness was his dominant characteristic. A man who slaps his sister out of anger. A man who saw as solutions to things chopping people's heads off. Which is an easy way of dealing with your opponents, but it certainly doesn't indicate that you're on the right path. These are the men of, around the Prophet. He becomes one of the greatest human beings that's ever existed because they embodied the word and they transformed their societies. They became healers. They became atibba. They became people of medicine, of Quranic medicine, the people of the Shifa. This is who they were. And it doesn't end there. The story does not end there. We have in this time, we have men like Uthman Danfodio, a, a, a scholar living in, in Sokoto in northern Nigeria. And within a short period when he sees the British incursion into his country, he rallies a whole nation of people. He teaches them, he illuminates them, he mobilizes armies, and he establishes Khilafa. Umar Tal, who fought Arab slave traders in Senegal. A man who was transformed by the word, because the word is transformative. The Book of Allah transforms human beings. It changes them. It changes them. This is the power of Qur'an. If we look in this time, Malcolm X, who was Malcolm Little, that's what he was. He was little. He was an insignificant drug dealer. He was a criminal with a criminal mentality. And he's transformed by Islam until he becomes an inspiration for people in this time, an inspiration for the transformative power of Islam, for the ability of Islam to transform human beings. This is Islam. Islam is transformation. If we are not impacting on this society, the society is impacting on us. If we are not changing what is around us, we are being changed by what is around us. If we are not healing, if we are not out there healing, then other people are infecting us. This is the nature of reality. It is ziyada and nuqsan. It's increase and it's decrease. This is the nature of reality. You can't change this. This is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now Allah, I wanted to talk about some other things, but my, my time is, is limited. But I want to say that I want to say that this society is in crisis. It's in serious crisis. If you look at the Quran, you must obtain Quranic worldviews. You must look into the Qur'an and read the Qur'an. Look what the Qur'an has to say. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroys people. There are asbab al-halak. If you look at those 
causes for destruction. Those causes for destruction are increasingly manifest in this society, in Western civilization. I believe that we are witnessing a civilization in death throes. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He brings life to the earth after its death. Something has to fill the nihilistic void. Because nihilism is ultimately a spiritual crisis. It's my contention that Islam is that thing that can fill that void and transform not only uh, these people, but the Muslims themselves. When I, when I was in Medina, I was in a taxi, and this man asked me where I was from, and I said that I was from America. And he said, originally I said, yeah, I became Muslim. And he said, the one that guided you, he's able to guide me. And it reminded me of a, a poem, a line of poetry. فَإِنْ عَبِقَتْ فِي الْغَرْبِ أَنْفَاسُ ذِكْرِهِ وَفِي الشَّرْقِ مَعْلُولٌ تَعَافَ مِنَ الضُرِّ If the breaths of his remembrance diffuse in the West and there's a sick man in the East, he'll become cured of his affliction. The last thing I want to say is that I believe that we are like, as an ummah, we are like the three people who didn't go on the Ghazwat of Tabuk. And Ghazwat of Tabuk is an interesting Ghazwa because it was towards the Romans. And the last action that the Prophet actually did was he sent an army to Rome, to the Romans, to the Europeans, Ban al Asfar, the white people, my people. And the Prophet ﷺ actually got out of his bed and, and went up onto the mimbar to make sure that that army went out because the Muslims were in a crisis internally around uh, the peninsula. But the Prophet demanded that that uh, army go out. And it went out. The Prophet said, I'm not worried about the Persians for you. I'm rather worried about the Europeans. I believe that we are like those three people that didn't go on the jihad. We all have our own reasons. They had their reasons. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling us to jihad. And I, in all honesty, have to say, if Islam is not a threat to this society, then I'm in the wrong religion. I don't believe that. I believe that Islam is in fact, it is a threat to this society. It's not a threat in that we're going to blow up buses. This is my disclaimer. We're not going to blow up buses. You can rest assured, people of Kansas, or wherever we are. <laughs> we don't blow up buses, right? I'll say it again. But we are people of jihad. And jihad is struggling in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring down the barriers of injustice that deprive humanity from realizing their true potential, which is to be slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I just want to uh, end by saying the ayahs that came down, they're beautiful ayahs that came down about these three people, and I think they apply to us in this time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعَلَى الثَّلَاثَةِ الَّذِينَ خُلِّفُوا حَتَّى إِذَا ضَاقَتَ الْأَرْضُ بِمَا رَحُبَتْ And those three who stayed behind until the earth itself became constricted for them. وَضَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنفُسُهُمْ وَظَنُّوا أَنَّ لَا مَلْجَأَ مِنَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا إِلَيْهِ Their own selves became constricted until they realized that there was no place of refuge from Allah except to Allah. There's no United Nations. There's no world community. There's no President Clinton. These are not refugees. These are not places of refuge for the Muslims. The place of refuge for the Muslims is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is what the Muslims have to realize. The place of melja'a is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Firru ir Allah. Flee to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what this ummah must do. Tubu ilallahi, tawbatan nasuha. Return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a sincere tawbah. All of that is afflicting the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is all from what we have earned. 
whether it's Bosnia, Kashmir, Afghanistan, Pakistan, everywhere in the world, it is from our own selves. And we have to take on the Quranic perspective and quit blaming things outside of ourselves and recognize we are the disease. And then we have to take the cure. And the cure is in returning to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Sayyidina Ali said, ما خلاص يوم إذن يا رسول الله What is the way out on that day when the Prophet said everywhere would be tribulation? He said, Kitab Allah, the book of Allah. We must return to the book of Allah. The earth has become constricted for us. Our own selves have become constricted for us. But we have to realize there is no melja. There is no refuge from Allah except to Allah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he liyatubu, and then he made tawbah to them. When they had this realization, he made tawbah to them and then they made tawbah to him. The realization must proceed and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will turn back to us when we give up fleeing to the kuffar for help, when we give up asking them to give us arms to defend ourselves, when we realize that there's nothing except Allah's own, His help, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will turn to us. And when Allah turns to us, there's nothing that will stop this deen. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says three times in His book, هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولُهُ بِالدِّينَ الْحَقِّ بِالْهُدَى وَالدِّينَ الْحَقِّ لِيُظْهِرُهُ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّهِ He is the one that sent His messenger with the truth, the deen, the guidance, and the deen of truth to manifest it over all of the deens, to make it flourish over all of the deens. This said twice in reference of the Mushrikeen and once in Surah Saf which deals with the Jews and the Christians. There are only three diana in the Islamic uh, viewpoint. There are the Mushrikeen and the Jews and the Christians. Those three ayahs represent the, 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 all three of those deens. And Allah will manifest this deen, and we have to be people. And if we're not, If you turn away, Allah will replace you with other people, and they won't be like that. Thank you, Brother Hamza. Uh, there would be time, inshallah, for question and answer at this end. Our next speaker is Brother Mazin Hashem, who will talk about prerequisites to be able, to, as Muslims, to address American problems or American ills, if you wish. Uh, Mazin Hashem had his bachelor in computer, then he had his master's in sociology. Uh, some people think he wised up by going to sociology, but actually he planned it that way. And now he is uh, preparing his PhD in sociology. He is the director of uh, Islamic Research Institute called Islamic Civilization Center. Uh, I have the honor to introduce Brother Mazen. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم American problems Islamic solutions we can address that from two uh, on two levels first our problems as Muslims in America and second uh, America's historical or intrinsic problems and how we can deal with it as I am, I would talk about the prerequisites for uh, to approach the problems. Uh, the prerequisites cover the two these two levels. The first thing, the first prerequisite, is to understand America. If you want to solve something, you need to understanding first. If it is a disease, you need to diagnose this disease. And in that respect, we need to understand the American history. Many of us came to America, immigrated to America, and saw America, if we may, we may say, mature, developed, for a better word. We need to understand how America developed to this situation and to this uh, uh, stage. We need to understand America, how it became a big power, a world power. 
We need to understand why America is advanced techni technologically. Uh, under understanding, we also need to understand uh, the American social system. What are the dynamics of society? The, soci the American society is so complex, is so complex, and we need to understand the different dynamics because some of the factors that play a role in the American society are opposing factors. So we do, do not want to concentrate on one thing while uh, uh, overseeing another thing. And in that respect, many Muslims try to uh, pick up some statistics to show how bad America is. That is not enough. That is not enough. The thing is more complex. And numbers do not speak about facts. We need to understand these numbers in context. Why did that happen? And what are the uh, contributing factors that, uh, 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 that give us, uh, that give such st uh, statistical figure? And third, we need to understand that America is an ever-changing body. America is not static. If you try to write a book now about America, by the time you finish the book, it would be outdated. And that is part of the American nature. And uh, on that note, I like that we design kind of course to introduce it to our newcomers, a newcomer course where we orient them about America and we teach them about the history of, of America, about the, the social problems, about the strong points in America. We should not be blind or unjust. There are strong points in America and we need to, to, to learn them and to understand about them. You know that uh, America itself, when it sends its amb ambassadors to foreign countries, they give, they give them orientation sessions. And we need, we, I think we badly need, to design such a course. Every Islamic center should have a course where the newcomers get introduced to the new land and know how to deal with it. The current situation is we let the person, people, the newcomers, struggle for uh, four or five years and learn, and learn from their mistakes. It is not the most efficient way to deal with our energy. That's the first prerequisite, understanding America. The second is to have a sense of belonging to America. If you do not have some kind of sympathy to America, you cannot deal with American problems. It's like the counselor who does not care about his patient. Or even if we have a, a, a counselor who hates his or her patient, the matter is, or is, is, is worse. So we need to develop a sense of belonging to America. And we need, in particular, we need not to confuse America with American foreign policy. We might not like American foreign policy, and we might have good reasons for that. But America is not Washington. America is bigger than Washington, and the American society is different than what uh, happens in, uh, uh, in Washington, or what decisions take place there. And here I like to mention that Islam has no national identity. Islam is not restricted to a land or a time. And uh, I cite uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, in his book, uh, his famous book, Al-Fatawa, he was asked by a person, tell me what is the best place in Earth, uh, in Earth so I can live there. And he said, I will tell you the story that happened between two Sahabis. The Sahabi in Medina, and I forgot the, both the, uh, the, their name. The Sahabi in Medina, sorry, the Sahabi in uh, Bilad al-Sham, in the first uh, crescent, wrote a letter to his friend in Medina, and he said, come to the blessed land, ila al-ard al-mubaraka. 
And the Sahabi in Medina replied to him, Inna al awdha la tuqaddisu ahadan, wa inna ma yuqaddisu rajul amaluhu. Land does not bless anybody, but what bless a person is his or her own deeds. These two prerequisites, understanding America and sense of belonging to America, I think, should be reflected in our literature because some of our literature reflect alienation more than vision or my, our, some of our old literature. I'm, and I am happy to see new books with the new flavor and new orientation. And that should be reflected also in our educational system. We do not want to raise uh, uh, children with a ghetto mentality, iso iso who, who, who prefer to be isolated and live alone. Once we developed this sense, sense of belonging and we understood what we are going to deal with, now we, are, we have the potential of islah, of doing good, to people. And here we need to, under, to recognize the nature of American problems, and I would name two major ones. First is that there is no point of reference in America. There is, tot there is absolute rel relativism, no, no point of reference at all. In schools they say to them, to, to, to ch children, develop your own value system. The second is legalism. Everything should be, uh, everything should be, the, the American mentality sees that every problem should be solved through legal decrees, through rules, but that's not enough. Regulation, regulations do not solve problems. It, it, regulations put boundaries but do, uh, but do not address the problem itself. <clears throat> and now, after understanding, uh, uh, recognizing the prerequisite, and recognizing in general terms the nature of American problem, we can proceed and put and imagine the basis for approaching the solutions. What are these bases? I have five of them. First, we need to perfect the American ways. We need to listen, we need to learn, we need, we need to uh, get feedback and make it uh, and take it seriously. And specifically, we live in America with the country of packaging. The American culture is fond of packaging. And many Muslims do a lot of good deeds and and really, in, in, in fact, they, they do contribute to America, but they do not present themselves the way, the, the, the way that is uh, appropriate to this country. So we need to work on our packaging system. Second, we need to proceed in our approaching the problem in open participation with the mainstream efforts. It is okay if, if we have a unique system of solving a, a specific problem, that's fine to design, to open our own organization. But if we do not, what's wrong with joining Amnesty International? Does it hurt? And it, that's more, that makes sense more if we do not have the expertise to do such a, such a thing. We can learn from the, uh, from the other. And we need to learn the art of coalition, where you share with others some specific goals and you proceed with them on these specific terms. Third, we need to redefine, reposition, realign our institutions. Not to serve, 
Muslims per se, but we need to understand that we are serving humanity at large. More specifically, I like to mention the political activism. It is not enough, or it is not the right approach to use the political forum just to nag on America on the bad thing it does or she does. The political system is part of the American body. And if we need to be politician or we uh, political activists, we need to share on all levels. It is a part of the system. It is not a system just to uh, pinpoint the bad things about America and uh, uh, take it as a pulpit for, uh, um, for problems and uh, for, our, for, uh, for things that hurt us. It, it works both ways. Fourth, we need to address America with a civilizational message and not with the details of Sharia and Fiqh. And that's very known in, in Islamic literature. That, uh, and it's logically you cannot address a person with the details of a, of a system that he or she does not believe in in the first place. What I am saying and uh, what I am trying to, to, to point to is we need to address America with our basic values. We need America to understand that we Muslim, that we in our Quran says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ That the Quran says about Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in defining his mission that we have sent you but as mercy for the world. We need to address America with such address with such messages, not to, uh, with the details, not uh, of our Sharia, and uh, definitely not with our penal system, like uh, whatever uh, the, the punishment for uh, fornication or, or uh, uh, theft or whatever. <clears throat> and finally, we need to understand a divine law which is graduality. Things do not happen like that. We need to go gradual, and we need to accept the gradual improvement. Things cannot turn upside down in, in one shot. After that, recognizing these bases, we will be able to introduce sub, uh, our, our own values, our own mentality, and name it, and you can uh, uh, take from the Quran many and many things. For instance, we can introduce moderation as a basic Islamic value. We can introduce modesty and beauty, but not restricted to the physical beauty, but the beauty of the spirit and the beauty of 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 clothes. Of I mean. In the Quran, say, Ya yo levina wa anzelna alaikum libasan warisha. Libasan warisha, when he defined beauty. So, beauty is not in the physical sense only. We need, uh, we can introduce the, the concept of parents and elderly kindness. We may uh, introduce the, the term parents abuse. These are basic messages that America can understand and we can benefit America and we can benefit humanity with such me messages. And finally, I like to say that solutions cannot be implanted, cannot be imported. Solutions grow from within. Solutions grow in native soil. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, Brother Mazen. Takbir. Takbir. Now again, uh, American problems, Islamic solutions, 
Where does it say in the Quran that Islam have the solutions for America's problem? One verse I found says in Surah Taha, فمن اتبع هدايا فلا يضل ولا يشقى ومن أعرض عن ذكري فإن له معيشة ضنكا ونحشره يوم القيامة أعمى. Those who follow my guidance, he will not be misguided and he will not go into misery or fall into misery. And whoever turns away from my remembrance, from my message, he will have a narrow life, a difficult life. In this life, that's what the Quran says. In addition, وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى And he should, we shall raise him up blind on the day of judgment. So, whoever follow the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that will solve his problems. He will not have a difficult life or a narrow life. Our next speaker is Dr. Ilyas Bayunus. He is known to all of you. He was ISNA president in 1983-1985. He is a professor of sociology at State University of New York. Uh, Dr. Elias. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والسلام على رسوله الكريم My brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته It was in the early 70s that the MSA was holding a, con holding a series of conferences on the same topic as we are discussing today, American social problems. Those were very trying times for we Muslims in North America. There were economic, a series of economic recessions beginning in the early 70s. Muslim population was just exploding through immigration, mainly. And many of us who actually had graduated from the American schools and the universities <coughs> We're now beginning to settle down and we were becoming professionals, we were becoming married, family men, parents and so on and so forth. And so this change of status from a student, from bachelor, unmarried to become parents was bringing a new kind of a consciousness in us became more and more concerned about the future of our families, the future of our children, the f our future generations, and so on and so forth. Uh, today, 20 years later, the first time in these early 90s, now again we are talking about social problems that we are surrounded by in this American society. But then there is one very big difference in the way we were talking about the problems in the early 70s and the way we are talking about these problems today. At that time, our approach was definitely very defensive. Our tone was de definitely very defensive. Our tone was, our basic question was as to how we could save ourselves, our children, our future families, and our future generations from the onslaught of juvenile delinquency and drinks, drinking and 
immorality as it was spreading across the campuses and into the society and so on and so forth. Today when I look at this theme of the convention though, Muslims for a better America, it really has a completely different kind of a tone. It definitely shows that we Muslims have acquired a greater amount of confidence. We have been here for a longer time and we have been able to prove to ourselves and to others that probably we can survive in this continent in spite of the fact that we are surrounded by a very highly problematical kind of a society. Not only that, we can survive in this society despite its very serious problems. My very first reading of this theme was that we could do something about this society. That we could not merely live our own in, within our own cocoons, our own sheltered confines of our masajid and our own communities and teach our children Islam, give them a very good secular education, make them very successful in their schools and colleges and put them on the path of becoming very successful American citizens otherwise. It almost looks as if the tone of this theme is in accordance with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukharujatil in nas ta'amuruna bil maruf wa ta'anhana anil munkar wa ta'aminuna billah. You are the very best nation which has been raised as an example for mankind. You are the ones who establish what is best, you stop what is evil, and you are steadfast in believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But is this really the case? Is this theme really so true? If you look around among ourselves, among the ranks of six million Muslims, as very fond of proclaiming, how many Muslims are really practicing Islam in this continent? Some people say only 10%, some people say only 5%. Look at our masajid, look at the number of children who come to our schools, look at materialism, which is spreading across the whole spectrum of our population in North America. We are becoming very highly Americanized, as many generations before us had become. We are, as a nation as a whole, we are probably going on the same, in the same materialistic direction as American society is going. We have not yet really, really started beating our wives as much as many Americans do. We probably are also not drinking in such high numbers and in such high quantities as the general American population does. True, our children our teenagers really have not become truant from schools and from the fam families, haven't started running away. And true, we are not really becoming homicidal criminals. However, if this materialism continues in our population, then the day is not very far 
when the Irish came to this country, they were regarded as very law-abiding citizens. So law-abiding, so much in defense of the law of the land, that Irish actually used to be in the forefront of the police force in this country. Greeks, Poles, even Italians who actually have a very bad rap because of the Mafia, were considered to be very law-abiding citizens. And so in the beginning, probably immigrants do show a great deal of law-abidance, and so we are also showing a great deal of law-abidance, but if this materialism continues, the day will not be very far when, if not our children, their children, maybe on the road to become Americanized and the day, and the day they, may, they become Americanized, it means that they will behave like their fellow children behave in schools and in colleges and in the neighborhoods wherever we live. What are those things which are generally considered to be very highly problematical in this society? Uh, offhand, there are so many things which come to mind. Very high rate of criminality, the very highest rate of crime in the world, the very high, highest rate of homicide in the world is in America. The rate of forcible rape is the very highest in America. Rate of drunken driving is very high in United States. And therefore we also have very high highway accident rate in United States. But you see there are actually, these are not really the problems, these are only symptoms of the problems. When a man comes home at six o'clock, takes some cans of beer, sits in front of the TV and drinks beer after beer can and then he gets up, beats his wife and his children and yells, abuses at them. This is not a problem, this is only actually a symptom of a problem. The main problem actually is that American society is one of the most materialistic societies in the world, the, one of the most sensate societies in the world. And many of us Muslims are, I mean, who came to this continent did not come here for the sake of spreading Islam. We actually came here, most of us, for the sake of greener pastures, better living. We were not starving in our countries. Most of us were not starving in our countries. Actually, the very educational and professional composition of Muslim population in the United States and Canada shows that we were some of the very best educated in, even in our own countries. Back home, we were already doctors, engineers, professors, accountants, businessmen, and so on and so forth. But we came to this country so that we could get better rewards, so that we could become millionaires, maybe, so that we could have better cars and better homes and uh, better education for our children and so on and so forth. In other words, we came here for, most, most of us, that is, came here for purely materialistic reasons. And to the extent that that materialism is spreading, like my brother said, like a disease in our body, in the body politic of the Ummah, then the day is not really very far when Muslims will become assimilated in this society and there really will not be any distinction between Muslims and non-Muslims in this society, except for those very few, for those very few brothers and sisters 
who are flocking around the platforms of Isna and Ikna and Varsuddin Muhammad and Jamil al Amin and Siraj Bahaj and many, many, many other small and large platforms like this. But we definitely, we are so awfully few. We are so very few. And because we are so very few, therefore we have to take a very aggressive approach. A very aggressive approach, which is suggested by this title. We have to take a very aggressive approach, not only toward this society in which we are living, but also toward other Muslims with whom we are related in religion. We have to do the dawa, we have to do the dawa. Brother Bassam says that I have only 15 minutes, but I will take only five minutes, inshallah. <laughs> when Isna was established in, in 1983, our very first slogans were dawa and Tarabiya. We have to do the dawa and we have to educate ourselves and our children. That was not really merely an emotional kind of a slogan. It was a very thought out plan which was given to Isna from the very beginning. We in this society really cannot survive without doing dawa among non-Muslims and among those Muslims who are running away from Islam. Otherwise, this tide of non-Islam among Muslims and among non-Muslims is going to engulf us and our forthcoming generations very soon. And when we are talking about the dawa and Tarabiya, we are then in a way saying that we have something that you do not have, that we have something that you brothers have lost. So, oh brothers in Islam and oh brothers in humanity, come and listen, come and see how we live. Why is it that we are not suffering from the same problems as you are. This is, how, this is what is meant by Kuntum khaira ummatin nas that we actually are becoming, we are an example, but are we really? This is, each and every one of us actually has to ask this question. Are we really reaching, approaching that perfection whereby Others will see us and will say, these people do not suffer from any problems because they are Muslims. So that they may take lessons and they may follow our way of life. I really do not think that we have reached that stage yet. But then, as we are doing the dawah to others, to non-Muslims and to other Muslims, we actually have to do the dawah to ourselves too. We have to look into ourselves. Are we really, do, are we really deserving this dawah? Are we really doing the dawah the way it should be done? Do we really deserve the title to be called Da'iyan? Each and every one of us actually then should accept this challenge. Each and every one of us has to become the... We gather here in these conventions, we are gathering in these conventions actually for the last 30 years. How much Islam have we been able to give to our neighbors, to our students, to our friends, to our colleagues where we work. And how can we really give it to them if we run away from them 
may be afraid that they will ridicule us, may be afraid that our own life is not really perfect enough to ask them to come and see as to how we live, how we practice Islam. No, I really do not mean to say that all of us who are present here are also condemned. In fact, the very fact that we are here means that we have already realized that our lives are not perfect, that we have to make our lives more, more perfect than it is, and that we actually have to engage in an activity of dawah which will save not only the society around us, but it will save us too at the same time. This group, this little small group then, of relatively better Muslims, good Muslim, actually has to accept the responsibility beyond its proportions. وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةً يَدُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْحُونَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام تكبير uh, we have, we started late, so we are allowing ourselves a few more minutes to take some questions. While the brothers get ready, I will read a written questions I received uh, addressed to Brother Hamza Yusuf. <coughs> it says, you gave wonderful khutbah, but you did not prescribe the medicine to the sick. Instead, you called it the sick and called it virulent kufr. Uh, you also presented yourself and the Muslim in America as a threat rather than loving, caring saviors of our beloved country. Bismillah rahman rahim um, Well, first of all, I think the time was um, limited and it's very difficult to touch. I had a lot more actually to talk about, but I believe it is virulent kufr. I think it's spreading all over the world. I think when we have um, American television in Mecca and Al Medina and people in those uh, holy places watching LA Law, I think we're in serious trouble. Um, I also think that uh, that the brother said that America is one of the most materialistic countries. I think that the materialism certainly is not a monopoly in this country. Imam Madik was once asked, who are the worst people? And he said, Man bi dunyahum. Those who lose their deen by dunya. And he said, who's worse than them? Man safaratu safara. Those, the, even the lowest of the low. And he said, Alladina yudhi'una deenuhum bi dunya ghayrihim. Those who lose their deen by other people's dunya. If you look at the Muslim world, everybody wants to come to America where streets are lined with gold. Right? I mean, this is, they're losing their deen, desiring somebody else's dunya. They don't even have uh, dunya. I mean, these people, up to a point they have dunya, but they're, they're, uh, they're suffering greatly for it. Because the nature of dunya, you see, if you allow it to enter into the heart, uh, it doesn't cause anything but suffering. Because the heart is the place of iman. And if it's not protected, then it becomes diseased. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ said, that in the, the body of man, Araf al-Jasadi mudgha, idha sarahat sarah al-Jasadu kullu, wa idha fasadat fasad al-Jasadu kullu, ala wa hi al-Qalb. In the heart, in the body is a lump of flesh. If it's sound, the whole body is sound. And if it's diseased, the whole body is diseased. And isn't it the heart? So... That's, that's where the disease is, and I don't think it's easy to, to talk in five or ten minutes about... I mean, the Qur'an is a deep study, and what I'm telling you is study, is study it. Look at it. I mean, it's not something we can just talk about in a few minutes. It takes serious... I mean, we've become an ummah of slogans. <laughs> We're an ummah of slogans. That's what we are. La Sharqiyya, La Arabiya, Islam, Islam. That's what we are. Mudaharat. I mean, this is our jihad. The Prophet ﷺ said, the end of time won't come until jihad becomes shouting. Siyaha, just shouting. People go out and shout. I mean, Islam is a deep teaching. It's not something, it's not a bumper sticker. I love Islam. Read Quran, the final revelation. It's not a keychain. 
You know, this is the trivialization of the, of, of the deen. I mean, deen is awesome, it's alim. You know, so I, yeah, I am scalding the sick. Um, and uh, as far as a threat goes, absolutely. I believe that we are a threat. I do believe that. If Islam is not a threat, something's wrong with your Islam. And if you don't believe that, read the Quran. Because everywhere the MBA went, they were persecuted. Why? Because it threatens the existing social structure. Now we know that, that the reality is, you see the Quraysh, I mean these people were so stupid that, that threw out the Prophet because they were worried about their dunya. They thought he's going to ruin our uh, tijara, right? <laughs> Little did they know that now two million people, instead of a handful of people in the Arabian Peninsula come, now two million people from all over the world come, right? I mean the Quraysh haven't suffered, the, their dunya hasn't suffered by any means. <laughs> There's the richest people in the world. So they're, they're always the, their worries, they're, all these threats you see are in reality nothing. They're just an illusion. So he's standing up intimidating me here. So. <laughs> uh, and then the last thing, loving, caring saviors of our beloved country, America. Well, I'm from America and I'm sorry, it's not beloved as far as I'm concerned. I think this is one of the most treacherous countries that ever existed. I'm going to be honest with you. I think what, what this country did in Iraq what this country did in South America, what this country did to the Native Americans, what this country did to the African Americans, what this country, I mean, what, my land, uh, the, what is that, America, America, my land of tis of thee or whatever. I don't believe that stuff. That's why I became Muslim. And if you want to tell me that, that, that that's not Islam, well, <laughs> I'm sorry, I studied Islam. I spent a lot of time studying Islam. And I don't believe that. I don't buy that. I don't buy beloved America. This is a very sick country, it's a very diseased country, and unfortunately the Muslims now are, are suffering from the sicknesses in this country, you see. I mean really, look at your children. And you're the best of, of the Muslims. <laughs> look at your children. I've sat with them, I've talked to them, I've taught them. I mean we're in serious trouble. These are serious times. I mean it's not a joke, it's not you know, this is real reality here. That's what we're talking about. So, anyway, mashallah. We, we, we want to hear you more, but we want to hear the brothers. I think we might uh, agree or disagree on whether we love America, but all of us will agree that we love to save America. So that is a common denominator, denominator inshallah. So we'll take uh, microphone number one, and I would ask the brothers to limit their question or comment to half a minute and the speakers to limit it to one minute. Please. My name is Dr. Rahman. It may not be half a minute, but uh, I have said this many times. I'll say it again. People sitting there and on my right and left, we men are macho and we have neglected our women. We have neglected our sisters, our, our daughters. The same way, no, we did not neglect them for the material things of the house and jewelry and everything else but we have neglected them to provide them with the knowledge of Islam. The, the, the spark you and I have for Dawa, for doing something for Islam, how come we have not excited our wives, our daughters and our sisters? You ask a question from our sisters and they will tell you, Sister, will you, will you be answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The answer would be no, my husband. Because a husband, we men, we have pushed them in their mind that we are, we are responsible for everything. And that is, totally wrong. that is why we are not moving to the best the way we can. Our better halves are less informed about Islam. Our better half, we do not provide them an opportunity. In fact, some of our men hinder because they are afraid the sisters, their wives will become better Muslims. Yes, I think your, and, your point is, is very well taken. We, we have to appreciate that please we must provide women every opportunity and push them to the extent sitting there should be two women in sure our committee there should be two three women in everywhere there will be we should tell them look why could we, if we can if i can dream a, a, a very faint dream of being a Ubaqa Siddiq or Umar anhu, why can't you dream of being Aisha anhu, or Khadija or Siddiq yeah. so it is we we all have to make a confession and do something about it Thank you very much. Uh, microphone three, can you introduce yourself and if it is a question and not a comment, uh, would you indicate who would like 
who you would you like to answer it? Assalamu alaikum. My name is Assad and I come from Minneapolis. Uh, my comment is addressed to Brother Hamza. I would like to congratulate you for the wonderful discussion that you gave. I agree with your points that the country is diseased and we are part of the problem, we are part of the disease. However, in your comments, you said that uh, we are the disease, we are also the cure. And on this issue, you spent about two minutes on it, and I feel that that two minutes is not adequate. And I, I would be very grateful to you if you would spend some more time discussing this, because it's very important. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that's not his fault. That's the fault of the program structure. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. As, as quick as I can, just there's no doubt that the teaching that we have, whether we're applying it or not is another thing, but the teaching itself that we have, that what I was uh, saying or suggesting, that in reality it has to be embodied by human beings. It's not an abstract. Islam is a teaching that is embodied. That's what it is. And the Prophet ﷺ was the embodiment of it. The Sahaba were the embodiment. They didn't go with theory. They didn't go where they went. They changed the cultures and societies. Uh, the only thing I can say about this country is that I was born here. I grew up here. I was uh, a very much an, a product of, of uh, this society. But at a certain, at a very young age, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I recognized that there were very serious uh, contradictions in, in what I had been uh, raised to believe about this country. And those uh, contradictions made me look then at ways of resolving within myself that. And alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided me to Islam. Now, for me personally, if I look... Uh, we as an ummah, and this is the only way that I can see, we as an ummah have to uh, change. Now to get into the details of that, that's possible, it's not possible here. I'm sorry, this is a very limited platform. The, uh, we as individuals, you see, have to change. I mean, that's where it begins. It begins in your own homes. It begins by getting rid of your televisions. It begins by changing the way you live, you see. I mean, the way the Americans are living right now, this is taghut, you see. I mean, this is taghut. Because taghut is excessiveness. And these people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, Surely man has gone excessive in, in his believing himself to be independent. You see, these people are most... Uh, they're the most excessive people on the earth. They're devouring 60% of uh, the world's natural resources with only 5% of the population. And they're worried about the population explosion. You see, they're worried about it because it, it means all of a sudden that uh, there's, they're going to have to uh, start trimming their waistlines so that other people can eat. So we have very serious problems here. I have no doubt that this teaching is the is the truth and I believe that Islam will manifest it but I do believe that we're in a very precarious situation in this country I was in a, a town called El Centro where I went to school and there were people that I went to school named Lydia Muhammad and John Saeed and all these names and I asked them where they were they the first masjid in California was built there in El Centro California in the 1920s by Bengali farmers they married Catholic women they had children their children married people there those people, what they told me was, oh, my grandfather was a Muslim. That's all they knew about Islam. The masjid had closed down, you see. So, I mean, this is the reality. We have to decide. Ibn Khaldun, when he was asked about, uh, he was asked by Alfonso, one of the rulers in Spain, to come up and uh, teach there because he was having a hard time in Granada. And he wrote a letter. He said, as for myself, I don't have any uh, trouble. But my children, I could never allow them to grow up where you live. Because I cannot, la adhmanu lahum dini. I can't uh, guarantee that they'll have my deen. So he chose not to risk that. People have sacrificed on the altar of dunya. We're living in a country, if you want to know where you should be working, then look at the poor people in this country. Because as far as I'm concerned, everything that I have seen in the Quran indicates that those are the people that respond to the truth. Allah talks about al ladini yastakbiruna. Allah talks about al mutrafin. Allah talks about al mala. You see, all of the, those people, and in very derogatory terms. 
which is not a, a negation that there are good, wealthy people. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not a communist or <laughs> something everybody has to give up their wealth. That's not the point. But the point is, the people in this country that are responding to the Islamic teaching are the Afro-American peoples. That are, they are oppressed peoples in this country. We have done nothing. There are Muslims. If you want to talk about problems, there are Muslims now all over the United States that own liquor stores. A lot of them at their cash register, and I've seen this with my own eyes, had them in Fadli Rabbi. This is from the bounty of my Lord. They've built masjid. They built masjids with money from liquor. And they're in poor areas where black and Hispanic people go. Instead of like their grandfathers who brought the light of Islam to the poor and the oppressed, these people bring the darkness of shaitan. I mean, this is tragic. You see, we have people working at the highest levels of defense in this country, for good practicing Muslims, building smart bombs, that end up in, on Abdullah's head. That's where they end up, on Zainab and Abdullah's head, and little Hussein, who's five years old, in Baghdad. You see, so people have to, you have to question, uh, you have to question, what are you doing? You see, I'm not here to make mujamada. I can be a nice guy and say, uh, as Muslims for a better America and be a nice guy and do all these things but I'm sorry you know sometimes the pills bitter so Jazakumullah khairan I also want to apologize because I'm not usually this nasty but I ha I'm sleep deprived <laughs> okay uh, next is the sister and I really wish everybody would be brief in order to be able to hear as many brothers as possible and sisters Assalamu yeah. alaikum. My name is Malika Khan. I am from Santa Clara, uh, Santa Clara, California. Um, I want to say this. Uh, we do this again and again. We invite speakers from far distance. We all of us come from far distance. But we waste our precious time in uh, on-site presentation, which is a copy of a Western TV. For 45 minutes, the speakers were sitting here on the, on the uh, table. And we waste, from 8.30 until 9.15, we had to watch that copy of the Western TV. And we don't let the speakers speak what they came all the way from, uh, all the distance. And we don't uh, let the audience ask questions. So please, from now on, we shouldn't waste our time. And maybe we shouldn't have too many speakers. We should have one speaker and let him speak what he wants to came to speak for. Thank you. Jazakallah. I, I, inshallah. Takbir. I, I would uh, relay this to the program people, inshallah. Uh, yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Try to be brief, please. Yes. My name is Anis. Uh, Jazakallah khair, brother Hamza, for your honesty. I would like to ask this question specifically to you. Um, if ignorance is the disease, the ulama and mashaykh are the cure, they're the doctors, and the madrasas, the darul ulum, they're the hospitals. And we are trying to save others. I think our own iman is very weak. And ilm, true ilm is what can help our iman. I'd like to ask you, in this country, young Muslims, they're looking for specific answers. Whether it's earlier today, ikhtilaf, mixing between men and women. All they hear is, what feels right to you is right. If you don't feel bad about it, then it's probably good. I don't think this is what people want to hear. I'd like to ask you, what stands in the way of producing real scholars in this country? Jazakallah khairan. I think you brought up Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, an excellent point. The, you see, what has happened is we have adopted completely, part and parcel, we have adopted Western educational systems. Neil Postman said in a book called Technopoly, he said that the colonialists first came with their boats, and then they brought their armies, and then they brought their administrative uh, forces inside the colonial, uh, their colonial entities, and then they brought their educational systems. And once they had people educated, they left. And, and then he goes on to say, the Americans don't even have to bother with that whole process. They just send their television programs. But the reality of it is, you see, we look. I, I spent a good deal of my time reading uh, books that were written anywhere from uh, 1,200, 1,300 years ago. We're having a class in our masjid of Muatta of Imam Madik, which is written uh, in the first uh, century after the Hijrah. And uh, 
Uh, it's unbelievable. If you, if you connect yourself with these people, the, the, these intellects that, that were produced by the Islamic ethos, they're unbelievable. They're the most powerful intellects. Because I've read Western stuff. I've read their philosophy. I've read their medical books. I've read their sociolo sociological books. I've read their books. The, the, the quality of thought that the Muslims produced is, is phenomenal. It is unbelievable. Why don't we look at the methodology that produced those people? It hasn't been done. I went, I, I regret, mashallah, qadr Allah, mashallah, I, but I spent four years in what was called an Mahad al-Islami. Uh, I won't mention the country because I don't want to embarrass them. But it was a pathetic and pale imitation. I happened to go by good fortune or bad fortune, however you want to look at it, to some of the best uh, prep schools in the United States. And uh, the quality of education was so poor. I learned a lot of words like wahshi, himar, yakelb, you know, because that's the way the teachers address the students. And uh, it, it was really unfortunate, but that was the reality. The, the education that I did get during that time was inside private houses with shiuch, uh, who taught me. But the school systems that now exist in the Muslim world are pathetic and pale imitations of the worst of Western education. That's a, that's a reality. We have to look at the methodology that produced those people. One of the things, every single great scholar that we have, whether it was in medicine, in physics, in astronomy, in, in mathematics, whatever you want to look at it, his primary and fundamental education was Quran, was Logha, was Fiqh, was Nahu. You see, these disciplines that are extraordinary disciplines, and unfortunately we don't, uh, we don't look at that methodology. And it's written, Ibn al-Arabi, uh, Qadhi Abu Bakr, not the Sufi, but the Qadhi, uh, has a book on the methodology of Andrusia. One of the interesting things he points out, just to mention, is one of the, the most important things that the Andrusians were concerned about is the right handwriting of the children. They had to have excellent handwriting, which gives you an indication of, of who, who, who they were producing, you see. I mean, if you, if, you, if you create high standards, then you create people that rise up to those standards. If you continually lower your standards, what they say in America, the, the good news is this year's students are um, better than uh, next year's. The bad news is they're the worse, worse than last year's, right? I mean, that's the way it's going. It's just getting worse. And, and we accept that, you see. We, we kind of feel good and happy that, well, alhamdulillah, our little Islamic school is 10% uh, ahead of the public schools in national testing. You see, we are shortchanging our children. And I believe that uh, Muslim children should have a deep foundation in the book and the sunnah. Before, university in this country is indoctrination. That is what it is. It is higher indoctrination. If you go into that indoctrination process without having the world view of Islam, you will come out thinking like a kafir. Whether or not you're praying five times a day, you will be thinking the way the kuffar think because it's their methodology and you're in their arena. And we see the results that, that, that their uh, educational system has produced. Thank you. Yes, brother. Quickly, please. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Rami. I'd, I'd like to make a short comment on the issue of society's problems and applying Islamic solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this issue can be taken back to the Aqidah. Mm -hmm. I'm timing you, brother. Yes, just 30 seconds and I will mm -hmm. wrap it up immediately. This issue can be taken back to the issue of the Aqidah. We, we believe in Allah that he is uh, the creator, he created us to worship and to glorify him. Now the issue here is that Allah did not create us and put us on this earth in America to improve the Islamics, I mean the, to improve the American society. He did not place us here to improve the American society. He placed us here to establish his deen, to establish and implement his system. And the Prophet ﷺ showed us precisely how to do that. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Yes, sister. Assalamu alaikum. I have one question for Brother uh, Hamza. Um, the sin of ma'wanatul a'da by most of the brothers and uh, participating in bombs and participating in aerospace techniques and technologies. How grave is that sin? I'd like to explain to us and what do we do to make them stop doing that? Zakallah khair. Thank you. The, we know from the hadith that the Ibn Adam, right, 
uh, Kabul who killed uh, Habel, he has a portion of every murder that takes place after that. It goes back to him because he started that sunnah. So you're, in other words, and that is a profound and deep implication that our actions have very serious repercussions. You cannot see yourself as an isolated component in uh, an isolated uh, system. This system is interlocking. That is the nature of this system. It's a spider's web. You see, that's what Allah says. That those who take gods other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are like the spider that takes a web. And it's a spider's web, it's interlocking. And the Muslims right now are little flies all over that web. And the spider, uh, one, a good Muslim brother, it's getting me scared. A good Muslim brother once told, <laughs> a good Muslim brother once told me that America, it's like the bottled water that has the little paper cup. He said, the individuals here are like the little paper cup and they use you for their purpose, right, and drink what you have in your container and then right before they throw you in the garbage, they crush you. <laughs> it's not enough just to throw you in there, they have to crush you. And so people have to, to me, seriously, I would rather be, and I'm telling you the honest truth, I would rather be sweeping the streets, I would rather be kanas, I would rather be bawab, a doorman, than working for uh, these major corporations that I believe are the mufsidun fil ard. These are the people that are destroying our biosphere. They're the people that are uh, creating their carcinogenic materials and dumping them in Africa. You know, you can get a very well-paying job now by being a toxic waste uh, disposal man. No education needed. You just find some idiot in West Africa who will take the shipment and you just a middleman, they make uh, tens of thousands of dollars dumping tons of toxic waste. It's a big problem right now in, in Western uh, Africa. So, th I mean, this is the reality. How we deal with that, to me, each individual has to look into his heart. What am I doing with my life? That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to do. Fa'ina tadhabun. Where are you going? What, what, what's this terminal behind you what, uh, that you're behind? Well, what's on it? And where does it end up? And you have to look at that. I do not believe Muslims can work in, in uh, defense contracts in this country because they are not defense contracts. The Ministry of Defense uh, before 1948 was called the Ministry of War. That's what it was called. They changed it to the Ministry of Defense because it didn't sound good asking the people, we need higher taxes for the Ministry of War. You see, that doesn't sound very good. So we say Ministry of Defense makes us feel a little more comfortable. Uh, I haven't seen in my lifetime any defensive wars. I haven't seen it. I have seen offensive, gross uh, destruction of human life, of, of, of livestock and land, whether it was in South Vietnam, whether it was in Panama, whether it was in uh, South America, in Allende's Chile, wherever you, you want to look. That's what I've seen from this country. It's my country, and I can say that, you see. You might feel a little uncomfortable if you came from overseas, but I can say that, because I'm from here, and I'm just looking at it straight in the eye. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, please, uh, we will take uh, the brothers that are standing, but please, we would uh, ask you I'll not very brief. To, to increase uh, the line, inshallah. We will uh, take two at a time, listen to two, and then have uh, one response. So go ahead, brother, in microphone one. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Abdul Ghafoor Faqir. Um, if you're willing, um, I would like to address the president of Islam, Mr. Abdullah Idris, because I was, to, I was told to do so earlier, um, to answer, to have an answer to my question that I asked earlier and was brushed without any comment. Or um, you have 30 seconds. Yeah. Or Mr. Sayed, say it, please. Okay. I'd like to have an answer. Um, it seems to me that the question of defending the national aim to live under the cherished laws of the Quran and Sunnah was raised by representatives from Algeria and Sudan I guess the rumors circulated by the, me the international media and the networks of the established so-called fundamentalism of Islam and Islamism yeah. leading to yeah. terrorism. Yeah. Yeah. May I, 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 no, no, please, no, no. please let I me would, finish. Yeah, no, I would not let you finish. 
if we do this, I would, we would, I would finish joke, anyways. We would be the joke of the world. This session is for a specific topic. Uh, yes. And if we Muslim address everything in every session, we would be a joke. So please no, no, sit down. No, no, this please. is not a joke. I yeah, asked the this person is a earlier joke. and he told you me cannot, to ask the president. We have a session so about please, better like America. An answer. Would you please, Yaakhi, whoever is in charge, cut that microphone. Go ahead, Yaakhi, in microphone number three. Assalamu alaikum. I had a brief question and a brief comment to the brother right there. I forgot his name. You uh, spoke about presenting and packaging Islam to the West. My comment is that if we present Quran and Sunnah in its pure form, not in this watered down, a moderate version is the best way. And if you care to uh, comment on your concept of how to present Islam and package it to the West. Zach I, di <clears throat> I didn't mean to change the uh, Islam and uh, uh, present it to the West distorted. What I meant is when we introduce whatever Islam, whatever we have to America, to, uh, to anybody, we have to follow the, the correct methodology. We need to follow the, uh, the, the hikmah in introducing our subject. Uh, that's what I meant. It's, uh, it's common sense. And uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba, when they went, they sensed what people uh, like to be addressed in when they um, when they uh, called Khalid ibn al Walid to be a Muslim, Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam sent him a letter through his brother, and uh, in this letter it says that uh, I've known that you have a mind, a mature mind, that you will not stay in kufr forever, and that brought him closer to Islam. Thank you. Uh, I think we should have the discipline to at least adhere to the broad subject we are addressing. And in any conference, in any society, in any political party, in any place you are at, you're not allowed to do this. You're not just allowed to talk about anything you want. People, even in formal meetings, they approve agendas. And when somebody speaks outside agenda, he's out of order. So. Uh, we would continue, inshallah. Yes, brother. And brother. maybe, brother, you did not hear me, but I asked that no more people stand, uh, and we will talk only the people who are standing. So that would be our time limit. Brother. Yes, Yaakhi, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Abdul Haq. Uh, my question is to uh, the brother Bay Yunus and brother uh, Yunus. Dr. Yunus, the question is to you. The, the yes. two, yes. and brother Yusuf. Uh, if I understood you correctly, uh, the brother Bay Yunus uh, stated that the Muslim Ummah must evolve back into enjoying the good and forbidding the evil. And the brother Yusuf uh, basically stated that we need to internalize the Quran. Okay. And I'd like to know, uh, do they think that this can be done by the Muslims living in different localities and not living in a community and centered around the masjid, that where their lives are intertwined within one another, that they can evolve into this state. Thank you. Auz billah min shaitan rajim bismillah rahman rahim. Yaqi, when Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "Yadun ila al khair." then it means that we Muslims actually have the duty to invite ourselves and others toward good that Islam actually is. There is no escape from it as Muslims. So much so that the responsibility is so much that if I do not carry my message to a non-Muslim, I do not have an authority to call him a kafir. Because Kafir actually is the one who first listens to my message and then he defies it arrogantly, like Abu Jahl, like Abu Lahab. Inna lazina kafaru sawaun alayhim a anzar tahum am lam tun dirhum la yu'minun. These are the kuffar. But if I haven't given my dawah to them, you see, how can I blame them? That is the thing. And so here I was just discussing with Brother Hamza 
Brother Hamza actually is the one who rebelled from his society and came into the Ummah of Islam. And I came from the Ummah of Islam here. And my duty, I think, is to outreach the population which did not hear the message of Islam to begin with. So before even I blame these people, these who are corrupting the resources and polluting the resources and who are attacking us, their political leaders or whosoever making wrong judgments about calling us names, fundamentalists, whatever, surely they will go on doing it because we did not give them the dawah to begin with. Thank you. Yes, brother. And I would request our brother, Dr. Kilani. We have asked a brother here to, that we would limit it to the people who are standing. And I, with all due respect, cannot give you a different treatment. Yes, yeah. Uh, brother, I'm interested in uh, knowing what the, the good qualities of America are that you alluded to. You know, what, uh, what are these qualities that you, that you see that, uh, that I'm, I'm missing? Or maybe, I'm thinking maybe we're talking about the qualities of the American people, and maybe you could clarify that a little bit. Every culture uh, develops some uh, what they call cultural capital, if, if, if the word uh, is correct. Uh, some of the qualities of the American people is the openness of the American people compared to the closeness of many ethnic cultures and the formalities. Uh, in America, there is a, a degree of spontaneity, for instance, which led people to listen, led people to change their mind, to accept Islam, to discuss ideas, uh, to let you finish your sentence. Uh, some uh, cultures, uh, our cultures, uh, don't let you finish the sentence. They cut you. So we need to be fair. And uh, If you don't like people, don't let that uh, let you go out of justice, to just uh, evaluation. Thank you. Now, Dr. Kilani apparently has some case to make that he somehow, uh, uh, no. his talking is legitimate no. or something. Uh, First of all, I came here, it seems you didn't no, see no. me. No, we said, sisters, 10 minutes ago, we will take only the people who were standing at that time. And we asked everybody not to add to the line. And there was nobody there with, uh, I love really to ha listen to all of you, but we don't, you know, there is a time constraint to everything. Every good thing has to come to an end. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. First of all, I would like, if the title was The Problems of the Muslims in America, not the um, American problems, because we are not coming here to solve the American problems, but the, the, the Muslims, they have problems, and they should know how to deal with it. If I went to a physician, the first thing he will ask me, what do you feel? Therefore, as a person who is going between the East and the West, I ask myself this is a question. What do I feel? When I go to the East, to the Middle East, I miss something in America, and I feel annoyed with many things in the Middle East. When I come back to America, I miss something in the Middle East, and I feel something uh, wrong here in America. And I think such feeling, it is not limited to me personally. Many people may feel the same thing. Then here, what is the, the problem? In fact, the problem, we have to be objective and follow Quranic, Quranic approach in analyzing or making diagnosis for anything. When I go to the Middle East, I miss organization. I miss efficiency. I miss in doing things. Very, I miss the good treatment in the airports. I get scared the first moment the airplane enters this the air space of the Middle East. I expect the police will arrest me or something like that. Like that. There is a lot of things. I miss them there. And when I come back, I don't feel all these things, but I miss the warmth of social relations. I miss, I miss the, the morality. I miss men. Then, here the Muslims, if we want 
to follow the Quranic approach. The Quran says to us, Waqulu lin nasi husna. Say the good to the people. And Quran give us example how Nuh alayhi salam talked to his own people. Nuh said to them, you will not be asked about our crimes and we will not be asked or questioned about your deeds. For them, he used the word deeds. For him, his group, he used the word crimes, which, which means you have to talk politely to the others and openly about your problems. Therefore, in America, if, they, if there is problems, I'll positively, as a Muslim, share in, uh, offer solutions. If there are negative things, I'll not talk unless they ask me about it. And we have, I would like to tell the others, and perhaps the youth will not be happy from my approach. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when we understand Quran, we should differentiate between the Quran of Mecca period and the Quran of Medina period. The Quran of Mecca period, the Prophet was ordered, Warrugza Fahjur, neglect now their problems and deal with the positive thing. In the Medina, he began to criticize, and I would say this should be dies for the Muslims in America. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. We will. Uh, yes, brother, go ahead. Yes, yes go ahead. Brother, Asalaamu Alaikum. I tried, yeah, yes. Uh, my name is Mozum Sayed from Fort Worth, uh, Texas. I appreciate giving me this time. Brother Hamza, I came here to this because of that title. I wanted to know what I can do as a Muslim for a better America. I wanted to have some steps. I am one of those people who are doers. I'm not a philosopher. You are. From you I, or from the panelists, I wanted that. Uh, but I got a little confused what the message I got is, as far as America is concerned, it is Tawud. It's a gone case. I cannot do anything. That's the message I got from you. The country I left, it denied me that was an Islamic country that is still an Islamic country, full of ulama, full of mashayib, who always got us into emotional issues, but that country denied me the means to survive also, I didn't even get one job there. This country gave me that opportunity. And I want to do something for the people of this country, and the other thing is that you, a white American, or a black American, or a yellow American, you are so lucky you don't realize it. You are able to select and stand and think freely. And it has given you a alim like that. We, I am proud of you. There are so many things nice you have taken those selections, made those selections. Yeah, I think the I point still is want well from made. you those steps that I can take to serve you serve myself and serve this country. This, I don't believe that this country is a gone case. We can do and do a lot. Yeah, yeah we will have Brother Hamza respond, but after we hear the last uh, comment. Assalamu alaikum. I am Muhammad Hanif from St. Louis, Missouri. My question is to my beloved brother Hamza. Uh, it is a personal question. If you do not answer, I will understand perfectly. The question is that every person go through some incident in their life. What was that personal incident in your life that changed your life or brought you to Islam? Thank you very much. Okay. Go ahead. Brief, please. Yeah. Alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa Sudan, Ahl al-Irhab, terrorists from Sudan. <laughs> The new world order. So, right. Wallahi, the Sudanese, I, my sheikh in Muwatta of Imam Malik was from Sudan. His name was uh, Ahmed Bedwi Tayyib al Asma. He was from Umdurman. And he was a beautiful man. And he told me once, and this was years ago, he died long before the, what's happened in Sudan. 
before they became terrorists. They used to be nice people. He, he told me that uh, the Sudanese are from the Sabiqeen in the last times. You know the, the Quran says uh, that they're Sabiqoon, there's Thullatun min al awwaleen wa qaleenun min al akhireen. There's a lot from the beginning, the first part of this community, and a few from the last. And he said the Sudanese are from the Sabiqoon. Inshallah, of the, the last time of this community, and it looks like um, his words uh, coming around. So I love the Sudanese. Your minute is over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm glad to see, inshallah, that you're uh, taking over the Zimam Qad Uti Al Qaws Bariha, inshallah. The Arab, they say, the bow goes to the one that can pull it. Um, just to answer the brother, uh, about America and opportunities. Um, an American might say, well, you took a job away from me, so go home. <laughs> right? Yeah, there's a lot of unemployment here. You want to do something to help the unemployment? Go home and give an American your job. <laughs> you don't like that. It's not very nice. Well, um, what you can do to help America? What could you do to help where you came from? Did you think about that? I mean, that's an interesting question just to think about what you could do to help where you came from. But there are things you can do. Uh, one of the most rewarding experiences I've had is going to the prisons and meeting Muslims who, like uh, the Persian poet said, went to bed worms and woke up the whole vineyard. Human beings that have transformed. I've met murderers uh, that they're like angels. They're just beaming. And I can't even imagine uh, that person ever doing a criminal act because Islam has completely transformed him. They need teaching. They, they need to learn how to read Quran. They need people. They yearn for Muslims to come visit them. So if there's prisons in your area, go to the prisoners. And give da'wah. Muslims don't give da'wah here. That's a, this is a reality. Muslim, I know Muslims that have worked for uh, years in a company and people don't know they pray. People don't know they pray. I mean, that's just a wrap. People come to me all the time, brother, I can't pray. I worked in a critical care unit, right, where I had to be watching monitors and things like that, and I prayed. And the people in the unit used to tell me, oh, it's time for, for your sunset prayer. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's what, what it was. So if you are open about your deen to be, and then I want to also just say, because uh, I want to clarify one little point here. Um, there are people here, they're wonderful people, there really are. My, my parents uh, are really great people, they're not Muslims, but I'm sure there are many Americans like them. When I talk about America, I'm talking about a system uh, of one of the oldest civilizations on earth. 